The stage is dark, but the conversation is just beginning. Welcome back to the Utah Symphony Utah Opera Ghost Light Podcast, a behind the curtain look into the world of classical music and the artists who make it. I'm Jeff Counts. And I'm Carol Anderson. As a composer of iconic musical numbers, creator of legendary theater works, and a mentor to many young composers, the influence Stephen Sondheim has had on American musical theater cannot be overstated. Sondheim was widely praised with numerous awards to his name, including eight Tonys, eight Grammys, and one Oscar. He's just short of Didn't make the the EGOT EGOT without without getting, which one he missed? Missed Emmy. He missed the Emmy. Um, In 2010, on the occasion of his 80th birthday, Arthur Miller's Theater on West 43rd Street was renamed the Sondheim Theater. Much to his chagrin, he was embarrassed by this type of tribute. President Barack Obama awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the highest award available to a non-military citizen back in 2015. Broadway's most meaningful tribute came on December 8th, 2021, when just under two weeks after his death from cardiac arrest, the lights of the Great White Way were dimmed for one minute. Yeah, we lost him on November 26th of that year. So what a great tribute. I love the thought of all of Broadway tipping their hat to that incredible man. We're here to talk about, of course, Sweeney Todd. It's our first of the opera preludes of this podcast season. So are you excited, Carol, to be doing Sweeney Todd? This is not normal Utah opera fair. It's a little bit of an outlier for us. Uh, In my history, we've only done one other. I've been with the company for 20 years, and we've only done one other musical theater number, Man of La Mancha. Right. In during the Cultural Olympiad in 20, uh, what was that? 2002. Right. (laughs) They did Sondheim's um, magical operetta, A Little Night Music. I'm calling it an operetta. Um, In fact, this leads us to a little plug I would like to make genre. Topics can be confusing, can be fraught. There have been questions about, you know, music, theater, opera. Do they belong in the same season? Who knows? But I want to reference, if you're uh, listening to the podcast for the first time, after you're finished with this wonderful episode, which you'll, of course, be so thrilled to have listened to it, you'll want more. (laughs) Go back to last uh, the last episode, the first episode of the season, where we talked with John Domain, a conductor in all genres of music, theater, opera, Broadway, you name it. And in fact, he was the first person to conduct Sweeney Todd in an opera house back in 1984. So that might be a fun conversation if you want to follow up on that. Stephen Sondheim grew up on the Upper West Side of New York and then uh, spent time in boarding school. So he had kind of a little bit of a poor, rich boy upbringing. He, uh, his, his, neglectful relationship with his mother is a thing that his biographers have written about extensively. He um, went to a, a, a Quaker school, I think it was. No, it was a, what was that called? The school was called the Ethical Culture Fieldston School. And I recognize this because I just recently read American Prometheus, which is uh, the About seminal, yeah. it's a seminal biography. And he was also a student at this school. Uh, and then he went to a Quaker school in uh, Bucks County, Saint, the George School. And so he had this little bit of a, a neglectful, sad, in a way, childhood, I would think. And in fact, his antipathy towards his mother lasted throughout. He didn't even go to her funeral because of the way she manipulated their relationship. And uh, I'm not saying that to say poor Stephen Sondheim. I mean, he found a home and a family in the theater. But it's interesting to see sort of uh, how one's childhood can shape the journey. I doubt I'm the only person that thinks that the story you just told sounds like a Stephen Sondheim libretto. It, a little bit does. Well, a li- it's a little Dickensian in it a is. way. It is. It's it's one of the most New York origin stories I've ever heard. It's perfect for him. You know, his love of the theater started super early. He was age nine when he saw a performance of, I think it's, what's it called? Very Warm for May. Right. And what's the famous song from that? Uh, if you're uh, uh, an American songbook fan, All the Things You Are by right. Jerome Kern is right. the tune you'll recognize from this Fairly obscure musical. Well, that, according to him, planted the seed, and he recalled, and this quote is really interesting, the curtain went up and revealed a piano. A butler took a duster and brushed it up, tinkling the keys. I thought that it was thrilling. So it didn't take much, really. No, no. He, he, was, was, he was hooked from the first sight. Now, uh, one of the most important early relationships in his growth as a composer of musical theater was his relationship with Oscar Hammerstein Mm -hmm. II, the famed lyricist of the team of Rodgers and Hammerstein. And it's amazing how it came about. So his uh, after his parents split up, I think he was living with his um, mom, maybe other family, I don't recall. I 
sorry to be hazy on that detail, but they were living on a farm in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. He got to know the kid on the adjoining farm who was James Hammerstein, Oscar Hammerstein's sure. child. And so they became buddies, and that's how he got to know Oscar Hammerstein. Later on, when he was at the George School, he wrote a musical for the school. And he showed it to Oscar Hammerstein, who... Uh, told him it was terrible because it was a, a very callow work yeah. and then proceeded to spend an entire afternoon with him telling him why it wasn't working and what could be better. So Sondheim references that he learned more about music theater in that afternoon than people learn in their entire lives because he had a one-on-one with one of the greats. I imagine he could have, if he wanted to, have had many of those one-on-ones later in his life because he kind of became the next Hammerstein, didn't he? He was definitely a person who, we can talk a little bit about some of the figures later on that he did mentor. I mean, Adam Gettle, who is the grandchild of uh, Richard Rogers, the other half of that famed duo, is a fine music theater composer in his own right and credit Sondheim was one of his mentors. One of the things I think people forget, and maybe they don't, maybe it's just me, but when you think of West Side Story, the original Broadway hit, you think of Bernstein, of course you think of Jerome Robbins, but people don't always remember that Sondheim did the lyrics. Yeah, and it's funny how the partnership came about. Stephen Sondheim was living in New York and he had um, he had graduated, I think it was after he graduated from Williams College. While he was at Williams College, he studied composition. He studied with Milton Babbitt, actually, who was teaching at Yale. And Milton Babbitt is a very heady, esoteric kind of stylist, I would say. So uh, he, he would go into New York every week and spend an afternoon with, with um with Mr. Babbitt. So he was kind of at loose ends in New York. He went to a party and I don't get the idea that he was much of a sort of party guy. He sounds a little bit like an introvert just in what I've read, but he went and he ran into a fellow there by the name of Arthur Lawrence, our book writer Mm -hmm. of West Side Story. So they got to chit chatting at the party. Lawrence talked about this current project, which was a musical version of Romeo and Juliet. He pointed out that their original lyricists were Compton and Green, Betty Compton and Adolph Green, and they had were tied up in a project in LA. And so they needed they were looking for a new lyricist. So they offered the uh, option to Stephen Sondheim. Sondheim was not he had not thought I'm going to be a lyricist when I grow up. You know, he wanted to compose and write um, the music for these things, but he went back to his mentor, Oscar Hammerstein, and It almost was one of those things of, well, do you have something better to do at the moment? It's not the exact quote, but uh, he he said, you know, strike while the iron is hot. Right. A bird in the hand, whatever you want to say. Don't say Uh, no to this. And, of course, history was made in that amazing musical. And um, Stephen Sondheim was quite young. But, I mean, what a great way to get your toe into the business. And your name out there. I mean, it's huge. And to work on your chops. Right. I don't know how many minutes we are into this episode, but we've barely talked about Sweeney Todd yet. So Oh, I, think, I know, I, I know. We, we talked about Stephen Sondheim. There's so many books about Stephen Sondheim. He's a fascinating character, but let's talk about Sweeney. There's almost too much to talk about with him. <laughs> it would take several episodes. But yeah, let's focus on Sweeney now, since that's what Utah Opera is about to present. Is there any way to summarize this story, Carol, quickly? You know, it's a vengeance story, like Rigoletto, where Rigoletto is trying to have vengeance on the people who assaulted his daughter. Sweeney is looking for vengeance against the man who kidnapped his daughter and assaulted his wife. Uh, it's much more detailed than that. Sweeney's actually, he was uh, s- transported to Botany Bay, Australia, mm-hmm. in the 19th century uh, on sort of trumped up charges because the Judge Turpin wanted to get him out of the way so that he could then assault have his, access to have his access family. To his family. Yeah. And so it's really just a vengeance story. He comes back to London. He tries to rebuild a life, but it's in the, it's centered around the idea of vengeance. So every move he makes is about vengeance against this horrible crime. He's obviously lost a bit of his human soul in his time in Botany Bay, as well as the loss of his family. It's just um, destroyed him as a human. And so he becomes, with his uh, accomplice, Mrs. Lovett, a serial killer. Mm-hmm. And this is actually based on a penny dreadful and some of you may be aware of the TV show called Penny Dreadful. Yeah, what's that referencing? It's referencing these... Uh, little inexpensive broadsides. They were printed on terribly cheap paper. So, in fact, it's hard to find extant ones to look at of the manuscripts. It's not like a book that was made on higher quality paper and bound in leather. So they were essentially 8 to 16 page newspapers that were serialized stories that would be released periodically. And uh, they cost a penny. And they would have these sort of um, 
lurid stories in there. So there was one called Varney the Vampire, which I think is just a hilarious it's a name. Great name. And uh, this was kind of uh, 1830s to 50s. One of them was called A String of Pearls, and it was the story of Sweeney Todd. There's some supposition that the story of Sweeney Todd is a real, it's based on a real person. And there are some kind of references to serial killers who did uh, consume their victims. Yes. I mean, we see that in Hannibal Lecter. So sure. he's like a, a Victorian Hannibal Lecter. Um, but he actually, as far as I know, actually, Sweeney Todd never consumes his vi- victim. He just makes the victims available for the pie shop. They are certainly made available for consumption. And but I'm not sure that he ever partakes. They are. Um, I mean, it's like the original food truck. And it's like the most popular <laughs> food truck in London at that moment. It's a, fl- it's a food truck with a second story barber shop. <laughs> yes. And a, and, a, and a chute in between them for depositing material so that's just really it like so much great theater it's about vengeance it's about um you know and it's set there is some some directors have chosen along the way to bring out the disenfranchisement of the lower classes in uh mechanized you know fast becoming mechanized london and industrial london and about you know the industrial london brought many advantages into society but it also started to build a bigger divide and slums were created and so these are lower class people who were trying to function in life. So uh, the original Sweeney Todd production was kind of that way. And we uh, have a little bit of that in ours as well. We joked about it being Dickensian, the story of Sondheim's life. And there's there's a it's certain... It's like trashy Dickensian. Yes, though. there's a parallel to Dickens with these penny dreadfuls and with the story of people like Sweeney Todd. So imagine how the place looks in a Dickens novel, but you have to think of it as an HBO show. And make it dirtier. And make it much dirtier. So speaking of that, look, all opera has death. Some operas have murder. How does this stack up against the normal body count of an opera that people at Utah Opera are going to be used to? It is a large body count. But, you know, I don't want to harp on the... Yeah, it's a part of the, the story, obviously. I'm not trying to discount it. But there's so much more to the musical than murder. Yeah. All right, or, or, or what, what do we want to call it? Do we want to call it a musical? Do we want to call it an opera? Do we want to call it a dark operetta? That's what Stephen Sondheim came up with the best thing. He actually refers to it also as a, fil- a film on stage, a staged film, because uh, to go a little bit on a rabbit trail, he found this particular obscure film called Hangover Square. It's about a composer who, when he hears certain frequencies, goes into a schizophrenic murderous rage. <laughs> And Bernard Herrmann wrote the music for it, who was one of the great film composers. Mm -hmm. Stephen Sondheim saw that film and found it incredibly influential. And so there's a lot of influence of Bernard Herrmann in the music along the way. Bernard Herrmann, I think he he wrote um, a lot of Hitchcock film scores. exactly. So some of the spikiness is a real tribute to Bernard Herrmann. And if you want to find, there's a piece called the Macabre Concerto, which is the concerto that's the climax of this random obscure film which I, I couldn't find the film anywhere but found this concerto and it is very full I mean of Sweeney Todd is full of many references to this piece in a way well macabre harmonic language and such yeah dark I think is a great word and it's 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 appropriate in this context because most operettas are quite light right so absolutely the word dark makes sense I'm happy to use dark operetta I think it works perfectly for this and you know again not to um Ignore, but there, the 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 dark side of this. But there's a lot of humor. Mm-hmm. I mean, a little priest is one of the most macabre and hilarious musical numbers. It finishes off the first act. It's where Mrs. Lovett has finally. She's the one. She's actually the real criminal. Like you can kind of find a noble cause for Sweeney because he is, you know, he he's doing it for his family. When Mrs. Lovett, she's just trying to make a penny. She's, she's trying just, to have a better pie shop. And exactly. So you can actually honor the motivations of Sweeney. It's for his family. I mean, his method is maybe not honorable, but it's sort of a noble cause in a weird kind of way. But Vengeance is at least legible to us. Right. Yeah. But Mrs. Lovett is just trying to improve her business. She's just, <laughs> she's she's not a very good baker. Her meat pies are not delicious. No. And she needs a better product. It and, needed to be Soylent Green yeah, from the beginning. And that's what, that's her suggestion. In fact, Sweeney Todd just wanted to find he really only wants to murder the one person. Right. There are the two people that were involved in this assault, Judge Turpin and the Beadle, Bamford. She's the one that kind of built it into a fast food empire. She's the one who awakens the bloodlust in him. Right. She takes advantage of him and uses his need for vengeance as a way to boost her sales. <laughs> it's not great. Um, I- I'm reminded, we're talking about all this darkness, but I'm reminded and I want people to know that 
it's not all that. This piece actually includes my absolute favorite Sondheim song from his entire catalog, and it's Greenfinch and Linnet Bird. It's one of the most beautiful moments in music theater. It happens at a moment where somebody is sitting in a, a house, looking out a window. That house happens to be her gilded cage, and she's looking at her pet birds that are also in their cage and just imagining how they can be so beautiful and still sing and wanting that for herself. It's a gorgeous moment in the show, and I just – for me, it's it's a heartbreaking song, and I love it so much. So it's not all darkness. There's some pretty stuff, too. Yes, and there is, I mean, the characters, you know, you have Sweeney, who is this very dark, baritonal character. You have Mrs. Lovett, who is a, they, they reference her sort of a body dance hall, music hall figure. Angela Lansbury was the first one. Right. Uh, and really leaned into, that's actually in an operatic, if you're talking about ca- casting operatic singers, Mrs. Lovett has to have the most variety of chops because Mrs. Lovett's role demands that skill of belting that, mm-hmm. um, you know, not to push our earlier episode, but uh, John Domain talks at length about the belting right. technique, which is a little bit uh, different technique than most opera singers learn. And right. so we have a wonderful opera singer who's done many a Carmen, but she, uh, Audrey Babcock, is able to tap into the belting thing in a healthy fashion yeah. and, and really give us the flavor of Mrs. Lovett in a way that an operatic vocal progression won't give. But then we have like two wonderful sort of stock Lover characters we have Joanna the ingenue and Anthony and Anthony yep. Anthony you have to say Anthony Anthony pretty, thank you who is the young hero and I actually was thinking the other day this is a little bit off the track but if you're if y'all are familiar out there with the Barber Seville we have Rosina with the older ward she's the ward of an older gentleman who wants to marry her and he locks her away and a young person comes and serenades her from the street. And they make a connection that eventually becomes romance. That's exactly what happens in Sweeney Todd, which I didn't quite real. I hadn't connected the dots until the other day we were staging that scene. And I was like, this is a music theater, slightly more macabre version of Barbara Seville. Tim Burton Burton handles that moment beautifully in the 2007 movie, too. We'll circle back to that. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves. But yeah, it's a thing. That moment, it's really important. It's interesting that we're both drawn to it for different yeah, reasons. Yeah, yeah. Me for the song, you for the kind of uh, how it resonates and, you know, backwards into opera history. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, I also want to point out a couple of other great musical numbers. There's so many. Yeah. Um, uh, the big 11 o'clock number, 11 o'clock number is the one of the numbers that happens towards the end of a show. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, generally a hit, something that becomes excerpted from the show. It's called the 11 o'clock number because curtain used to be at 8.30 and a show would conclude at 11.30 typically. And so 11 o'clock was like the the time. And and often it was, I think, also to just wake up the audience and keep a little bit of an interest, not, it's, not it's, legit wake up. It's where in your show you put let it go. Exactly. That <laughs> yeah. is the end. Yeah. And in this case, the one that falls in, around the area of the 11 o'clock number is – Not While I'm Around, Mm -hmm. which is such a beautiful moment between Mrs. Lovett. We see her actually being human and caring about someone. This um, sort of uh, simple figure, Tobias, who they have rescued from being abused by Pirelli the barber, who is actually uh, Sweeney's first victim in the show. Uh, Tobias becomes an employee at the pie shop. And they have this very tender moment because Tobias, though he's simple, he realizes something's not right in this whole series yeah. of events. He senses that he he doesn't know what happened to Pirelli, for instance. And so uh, he's talking about how he feels uneasy and he's going to protect Mrs. Lovett at any cost. Nothing's going to harm you, not while I'm around. And it is a tender, beautiful, beautiful number and beautifully rendered by Christian Sanders, who's done Tobias several times. Don't go to this. sleep on Tobias. I don't want to say more than that, but yeah. don't go to sleep on Tobias. I, I'm i curious, Carol, what the critical reception to this was when it was first staged. I know that people love this property now. It's a it's a beloved title. And the, the, the characters are beloved. It gets done a lot f- at all levels of theatrical professionalism. Oh, sure. And There's been, a version for nine instruments absolutely. that you can do at a school. Exactly. And it's obviously it's been made into a Tim Burton movie, which we'll reference later. But how did it do when it premiered? Well, it ran for, what, 500 and some odd performances. So it ran for a number of seasons in Broadway, opened in, in 1979. I want to read a little bit from a couple of reviews. So the New York Times reviewer says, 
The musical and dramatic achievements of Stephen Sondheim's black and bloody Sweeney Todd are so numerous and so clamorous that they trample and jam each other in that invisible but finite doorway that connects a stage and its audience, doing themselves some harm in the process. So he goes on to say it's a huge he, – I think they felt like it was just such a big spectacle. They said He says there's more artistic energy, creative personality, and plain excitement in Sweeney Todd, which opened last night at the enormous Eurus Theater and made it seem like a cottage, than in a dozen average musicals. Then along – as he goes on, he talks about how it's almost too much for its own good. And it was this giant sort of industrial – set there were turntables in fact a little bit later on um this other reviewer or it's a person who actually writes about sweeney todd a few months into its run says we are without a perspective from which to view the mayhem and can only sit back and admire the earnestness and the efficiency with which director prince hal prince composer sondheim and librettist hugh wheeler and most especially designers eugene and fran lee have worked the turntables spin Bodies are popped into an oven. We quite believe a filthy street hag when she speaks of the stench and the strange fire in the sky over London. We are plainly in the hands of intelligent and talented people possessed of a complex, macabre, and assiduously offbeat vision. And so, but then it says, unhappily, that vision remains a private and personal one. So their critique is that it didn't connect Mm -hmm. the audience to the macabre. I think that that has gone by the wayside in in the illustrious history of the piece. Totally. But my favorite little story, and this is to, um, you know, back to the conversation of uh, opera versus music theater, which we talked about last week, is really being a product of the audience in the venue. You're in an opera house, it's an opera. You're in a Broadway theater, it's Broadway. Yeah, That's simplifying it, oversimplifying. But, he's, but um, a little story, it says that one of the great theater critics at the time on opening night, his name's Harold Clerman, rushed up to the then director, uh, our producer, general manager, of the Metropolitan Opera and said, demanded to know why it wasn't being shown at the Met, to which this director, uh, Skylar Chapin is his name, said, I would have put it on like a shot if I'd had the opportunity. There would have been screams and yells, but I wouldn't have given a damn because it is an opera, a modern American opera. Wow. That was from the the guy who was running the Met. That quote really connects to the last episode. That's a very interesting perspective. It sounds to me, first of all, no one has ever described my virtues as numerous and clamorous, but <laughs> I wouldn't mind if they did. But it sounds like the people who saw this first loved it, but were a little overwhelmed by it. Yeah, and maybe it just seemed like there was so much on stage that it they weren't able to really find its heart Yeah, right, right. off. The heart you mentioned before when you talk about the difference between Sweeney and Lovett and his reasons compared to hers. There's there's definitely a little bit of brightness in there if you're willing to look for it. I mean, maybe the, it was just people were too overwhelmed by the technology back then. Yeah, I mean, even though you've been um, conditioned to find these people villainous and immoral, the denouement, which is quite tragic, is actually quite touching and, yeah. and, and could be tear-jerking you know, in the right hands, we're hoping that's the goal. You know, it should, your heart should be broken at the end, even though you're seeing the demise of criminals. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of very complicated people in this show. Not a lot of easy rights and wrongs to assign it's people to. It's not black and white. Certainly not. I mentioned before the 2000- 2000. It's bloody it and is red. <laughs> black and bloody, according to that <laughs> review. Um, I mentioned before the 2007. Tim Burton version of this story starring Johnny Depp and Helena Bonham Carter. There's been a lot of sort Alan of... Alan Rickman, right, is Judge Turpin? Oh, oh exactly right. Yeah. I forgot that. Rest in peace, Alan Rickman. I know. I, I want you to talk a little bit about the different ways this has been presented over the years and the different formats and the different sort of pop culture, you know, iterations it's had because it's not just Tim Burton that has fallen in love with this material. Sure. I mean, I think that the character of Sweeney is... I can't tell you the number of uh, operatic baritones who, when they find out that someone's doing Sweeney, they come out of the, it's like Rake's Progress in, in a a sense, it's an opera, an operatic event that doesn't happen so often in his character, you know, that that people want to dig into. It's role of a lifetime kind of stuff. Exactly. And so pretty much any sort of big baritone singer has, has that in his wish list. And um, one of my favorite iterations of this and you can find it on youtube is the new york philharmonic's quote-unquote semi-staged version and i don't even want to give away the way the piece starts because 
it just it takes it turns it on, on its head so quickly, and it's just an amazing coup de theater. I remember watching it on TV back when you did normal network TV. This was maybe like 15 years ago, and um, it was on great performances with PBS. And it stars Bryn Terville, who is <laughs> one of the great opera, one of the great votans of yes. all time. Yeah, and Emma Thompson yeah. is Mrs. Lovett. She's not a singer, but she is compelling and amazing. And I then bet. it's a mix of of uh, Broadway and legit singers throughout the the rest of the ensemble. But it's it's re- it's a fun. I mean, that Ballad of Sweeney Todd, the opening, which is a, t- a tune that everyone probably can hum a little bit of uh, the the way it's just a brilliant way to imagine a concert version of a piece. Yeah. That's, I'll just say that and leave you to look it up. Definitely look up the movie as well. If you haven't seen it, I realize 2007 is out of the window of a lot of people's attention span these days, but it's worth going back to look at. I know that Johnny Depp films, people have a, a troubled relationship to, but if you want to watch a piece of Burton in his prime, I do think it, this is a good example of what he could do with not only look and feel, but with casting and with pacing. It's really, really well done. When it got done at HGO, and I think you said that was 84, mm-hmm. and John Demain, as we know from our previous episode, was on the podium. Did they do it like a like a Broadway show? Was it did it was it was it technologically elaborate like a Broadway show? Did they cast it like a Broadway show? It was cast with uh, operatic stars. I mean, I looked at the list of the cast, and it's people I've worked with. Tim Nolan was the original Sweeney Todd. Mm-hmm. I worked with him at Santa Fe in uh, a Rossini opera, The Italian Girl in Algiers. Joey Evans was the original Pirelli in Houston, and not the original Pirelli, the Houston Pirelli. Right, and he was um, he's been a longtime faculty member of University of Houston teaching young opera singers of the the opera singers of tomorrow and Joyce Castle was the the uh, Mrs. Lovett in Houston and she is a character mezzo who is very well known and is you know had a huge career so they definitely went the operatic version the operatic direction in casting that first Sweeney Todd in the Opera House but it was people that were already friends of Houston Grand Opera in a way and and major in their industry. I want you to talk about what people should be looking forward to at the Utah Opera production in terms of the cast and the production itself. But before we do that, I know that you want to chat a little bit about some religious undertones in this score. Yeah, one of the biggest... The probably the most famous medieval tune that anyone will come up with is the tune of the Dies Irae. Ask Dies, Rachmaninoff. Ask Rachmaninoff. Ask Berlioz. Yep. I mean, ask John Williams, who uses it when uh, Luke's homestead is destroyed mm-hmm. in um, in the the episode four. Uh, I mean, I've listened to entire podcast episodes episodes about this theme. It's this. Na da 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 da. It is Dies Irae, Dies Ila, Day of Vengeance, Day of Wrath. It was a chant that was a medieval chant that's always part of the Requiem Mass. Right. But it became this um, trope that people use composers, uh, classical composers. Um, it's at the beginning of The Shining. Yep. It, as you see them driving to the Stanley Hotel, the Dies Irae th- tune is playing in the background. So it's um, – and it's in this one, the big tune when the when everything explodes. You have Attend the Tale of Sweeney Todd, which is the original uh, – the main theme of the ballad. But then when the chorus explodes, you have Swing your razors high, Sweeney. And that is – an absolute nod to Dies Irae, and it comes throughout. And n- that's not the only, I mean, Sondheim's creation, his compositional technique uses a lot of motives that come in and out. And if you come to a show, I encourage you to come to the pre-concert talk just so you can listen to me share some of those motives so that you can listen to them throughout. It's just brilliant. But the Dies Irae is the most obvious uh, fabric that knits things together because it's Sweeney Todd's Day of Vengeance, Day of Wrath. Yeah, well, that that theme has been knitting music together writ large for centuries so it's a very important reference he's making right he's in good company so uh our pro- our production has some as i say it's it's uh, mo- cast with opera singers who are able to straddle the the stylistic uh divide if you right. will which isn't that far uh mike mays is our sweeney and he uh has actually recently done a ton of, he's a he's an amazing singing actor acting is he wants to, he doesn't want to do a project that's not exciting as a drama uh, dramatic performer so he just recently did and he won an award uh for this 
St. Francis of Assisi in uh, Opera Stuttgart that was like an eight-hour production that was a venue-specific one where they just wandered the streets of Stuttgart. This is Olivier Messiaen? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, a huge project. So uh, And he has made a name for himself playing the role of Joseph de Rocher in Dead Man Walking Dead Man, right. as playing a scary man on dead, death row. So he plays scary very well. Well, St. Francis isn't particularly scary, but... Um, but Joseph de Roche is a very intense character. And so he brings a huge intensity to the role. Uh, his actual wife is playing the beggar woman. If you know the show, you know why that's, well, anyway. Yep. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Um, so it's really just a, a thrilling cast. What I'm really enjoying, though, is the way the Utah Opera Chorus is digging into this. We uh, cast it very specifically with, you know, um, you know, just... It's a very it's a very idiosyncratic piece. It's not the same. It needed a smaller chorus, mm -hmm. voices that could be managed through um, amplification because we do use amplification. I know we don't do that in the opera house, but we do do it when we cross that line of into course. this other style. Or you would hear it. We used amplification in Revolution of Steve Jaws because of the electric component, right. electronic music component. Anyway, uh, the chorus is um, we were staging. God, That's Good, which is the opening number of Act Two, where the people are just chewing into the pies. And the joy and excitement that they're bringing to these roles, almost every one of them has a solo line because there's solo lines peppered throughout the piece. And so they're just having a blast. And so if you, yeah, it's a great cast all around, but watching the chorus dig into this project has been a delight. And we have a new chorus director this year, Austin McWilliams, who's jumped right into it with both feet first. And it's been a lot of fun to watch that relationship grow. Isn't a, isn't a production in an opera house like ours sort of dependent upon how much the cast digs in? Because we don't have turntables and the ability to do all of those technical, theatrical, spectacular things that a Broadway house would, right? Yeah, so, we can't rely on as much as I loved it. We can't rely on Josh Groban to sell the tickets. <laughs> I saw it. I loved it. But yeah. he's also not going to, you know, we can't rely on an incredible amount of fog and then he pops out of a mysterious trap door, right. you know, with like some sort of elevator contraption, right. which is, you know, it's, it was a coup de théâtre, but we mm -hmm. have to come up with our coup de théâtres a little uh, more budget consciously. It's 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 like a Star Wars film but that doesn't rely so much on CG. We're practical effects. Exactly. We're very practical. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited to see this myself. What are the dates of the run? Yeah, so we open October 12th, and we run. We have five performances, October 12th, 14th, 16th, 18th, and then a matinee on October 20th. And my hope is that people will come out of the woodworks. We're looking forward to seeing some new people in the Capitol Theater that maybe haven't come to see a Utah opera production, and they'll be inspired to come see the next thing. And we're hoping to create some new opera fans, but also just bring some people, make some people feel welcome who maybe haven't come to the Capitol Theater in the past. If you're not a regular Capitol Theater attendee for Utah Opera, Sweeney Todd is a great gateway experience. I think if you come and you love it, trust Carol and I, you will find the same drama, the same wonderful artistry, the same kinds of experiences the rest of the season. The same beautiful vocalism. Absolutely. Well, Carol, this has been great. As always, you make me so excited to see the operas that Utah Opera presents. Before we wrap up, though, where can people find information about this online? Check out utahopera.org and also follow us on the socials at Utah Opera or Utah Symphony. We have Instagram, we have TikTok, we have Facebook pages, and um, you'll see lots of behind the scenes footage, photos that, of, that people are sharing from rehearsals, and um, you know, just you'll see the magic behind what you see on the stage, the finished product. Before I wrap up here, our show in two weeks is going to be about the ZAP tax, but that's specifically what it's about. But more generally, it's about arts funding, right? Right. The ZAP tax is a, is a Salt Lake County specific thing. We're based in Utah, for those of you who maybe are listening, just found us randomly on, on the podcast waves. But uh, the Zoo Arts and Parks tax is a specific initiative that's been going on for 30 years. And we're going to talk about the genesis of that particular tax, but also talk about different ways the arts are funded publicly. If that sounds a little dry compared to a barber who murders people for a pie maker, trust me, it's not. It's going to be a really interesting topic. So tune in a couple weeks when Carol and I talk about the Zap Tax. Until then, thank you to everyone at home and on the go for listening. If you haven't yet, it helps us when you subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever you get your podcasts. It helps us get new listeners. For questions about the show or to suggest a topic, you can reach us at ghostlight at usuo.org. Be sure, as Carol said, to visit usuo.org for information about upcoming performances, and we hope to see you soon at a live one. 
Until next time, I'm Jeff Counts. And I'm Carol Anderson. Thanks for listening. The Ghostlight Podcast is produced and edited by Robert Bedont. The Utah Symphony Utah Opera season sponsor is the George S. and Dolores Dore Eccles Foundation.